Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening to the more than 150 persons who've registered for our webinar on mitigating the effects of COVID-19 on utilities in the United States and Eastern Europe. I'm Will Poland, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the webinar. I'm a senior director at U.S. Energy Association and director of the Energy Technology and Governance Program, uh, which is the uh, program jointly operated by U.S. Energy Association, USEA, and USAID uh, for, uh, to support energy market reform, uh, infrastructure development uh, in Europe and Eurasia. We've had a tremendous third, nearly 30-year partnership with our colleagues at USAID, and it's their uh, generosity of time and funding that makes this webinar and the Energy Technology and Governance Program possible. We're also joined by our colleagues and good friends from the Edison Electric Institute today, and three speakers from Eastern Europe who I'll uh, introduce momentarily. But before we do that and uh, go through the agenda, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Steve Burns, the Chief of the Office of Energy and Infrastructure in the Bureau for Europe of Eura and Eurasia within USAID, whose office makes this webinar possible to provide some welcoming remarks. Steve, welcome to the webinar. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Will. Uh, I, I appreciate the introduction and, and thank you to everyone that's joining us today. I'd like to welcome you, right, uh, also uh, to the webinar and, and just offer a few thoughts and, you know, just say that, you know, we at USAID and, and our partners at uh, USCA, EEI and elsewhere, right, have been working with uh, many of the utilities in the E&E region for the past 20 plus years. You know, we started with our utility partnerships and the early 90s and early 2000s, and we graduated into broader and more, more complex uh, collaboration in terms of uh, strategic planning, adopting uh, NSOE methodologies. Uh, we moved on to study integration of renewables uh, and, and on to, uh, to, to, to other partnerships, including uh, with some distribution companies on emergency planning and response. So we've, we've been through a lot together uh, uh, and faced a lot of challenges uh, over the past 20 plus years. Um, but this current challenge is one that I don't think we had necessarily foreseen or uh, you know, had, had uh, entirely prepared for. But what I would say is our history of collaboration in a way sort of has prepared us to work on this together, right? Our, our open conversation, our dialogue uh, with one another uh, is, is a great platform from, from which we can continue to learn from one another. And while it may not be apparent to our partners in the region, you know, what I would like to say is I always get notes back from our utility partners and our regulators that go to the region, you know, and express back to us at USAID how much they learned as well, that it's not just a one-way street, that, that, that we're all strengthened from our collaboration. Uh, so again, my thanks to everyone that, that's participating. So, you know, in that spirit, uh, we've got a good lineup today that Will mentioned. Uh, you know, I ask you all to submit questions via chat and to engage in the conversation. You know, that's what, uh, that's what this is about, this, this collaboration. And then I think on, on, on a personal note, you know, I, I would just, you know, hope that you all uh, would accept my best wishes, uh, you know, to you and, and your family. Uh, I've known many of you since I first started at USAID. And, and I want you to know that you're, you're constantly my thoughts and, and, and I wish the best for you all. So we're all in this together and I, together we're gonna, we're gonna make it through. Uh, this won't be our last challenge together, uh, I assure you that. Uh, so stay safe, stay healthy, right? For, for all of you, for your families uh, and, and for your countries. So, Will? Thanks, Steve. Uh, very uh, apropos remarks. Um, as you mentioned, it's been a, a tremendous partnership uh, between the agency uh, USEA, our utility volunteers, and especially the Edison Electric Institute, and of course, our partners in the region. And uh, we've overcome many challenges, and uh, this is just another one of them, maybe one that, as you say, have, we haven't foreseen, but uh, we'll do it together, and I appreciate that, the sentiments that you expressed. As we, uh, as we move forward in the webinar, please, uh, for those listening in, please maintain a mute on your microphone, and remember to submit questions in the chat box. Uh, we'll take questions as we can. If we are able to take them during the, uh, at the conclusion of each, each of our speakers' presentations, we'll try to do it at that point. If we're running short on time, we'll uh, do it at the, toward the end of the webinar. But please uh, feel free to submit them. My colleague, Albert Daub, who's not on camera, will 
be collecting them for you and he will be uh, broadcasting them to the participants, the speakers, uh, as, we, as we move forward. Lastly, uh, it's important to recognize that this webinar is made possible through the generosity of the American people and the opinions that are expressed herein are of the participants and not necessarily do not represent the opinions of USAID. Our agenda today is, uh, is a very good one. I think it's apropos for uh, the topic at hand. Uh, we'll begin with um, Scott Aronson and Dave Botts of the Edison Electric Institute who are working in a group called the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council here in the United States. They're working with their colleagues at utilities throughout the United States, collecting and disseminating best practices that are evolving and, uh, and developing uh, within the utilities. And it's a tremendous function that they're providing to share this best practices. We've shared a link with you to the resource guide uh, in the uh, email you received from Albert Dow this morning with the password and link. And you'll have access to that throughout the webinar and it's updated uh, frequently. This is version four, they'll explain to you. Um, following uh, their uh, presentation and discussion, we'll have three uh, representatives from leading utilities in Eastern Europe. Mr. Uh, Ilir Shala, who is the CEO of the Kosovo Transmission System Operator, will talk about uh, what the TSO in Kosovo is doing to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19 and maintain business continuity. We'll switch, uh, we'll switch gears and talk uh, to a, a uh, distribution company in Macedonia. Mr. Sasho Saltarovsky will talk about what it's doing and the impacts, uh, uh, particularly on cash flow, that we see uh, the, the, the impacts of COVID-19 on cash flow. And talk. maybe we'll talk a little bit about how that may percolate out through the sector as uh, the DSOs feel it first. And then we'll have another perspective from a TSO, Mr. Mikhail Zibzabadze from the Georgian State Electro System to discuss what it's doing uh, to um, secure the control center, talk with its uh, stakeholders, maintain critical uh, equipment and inventories. And then uh, we'll have a Q&A. Just before we start, a couple words, Steve mentioned uh, the long cooperation that USEA has had with the uh, USAID. Uh, this program and this webinar is made possible through the Energy Technology and Governance Program. Uh, this is a program that's been working cooperatively with USAID for the better part of 30 years to improve the energy security in uh, Eastern Europe and Eurasia, focusing on uh, operations and planning and on the mitigation and uh, uh, improvement of cybersecurity operations in the region. Goal, as I mentioned, is to improve uh, energy security and uh, uh, diversify the fuel sources in the region. We, we do that through a, a series of working groups, which you see on the slide. Uh, each of these working groups has, uh, members have been provided with either uh, ample amounts of training, uh, software, and technical support to conduct research and analysis on network planning for uh, to ensure that the both the gas and electric transmission uh, networks are robust enough, uh, reliable enough, and secure enough to create the backbones for regional uh, electricity trade, which a, which we believe will improve energy security. With that, uh, and with uh, with no further delay, I'd like to uh, introduce Scott Aronson and uh, Dave Botts who will talk about the uh, resource guide that uh, the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council has been developing um, and aggregating and disseminating. Dave and Scott, we really appreciate the generosity of your time. As with all the participants on the call, we know how uh, busy you are these days trying to keep the lights on and uh, keep everyone safe. Uh, and we appreciate your, your support and time uh, for the call today. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Will, and, and thank you, Steve, and thank you to USEA and USAID. Uh, I think a couple things that were said in that introduction are incredibly important, uh, which is that uh, no one was really prepared for this. And, and I don't mean that to be sort of snarky, um, in, unless you have actually lived through a, a pandemic and, and the last uh, global pandemic uh, you know, that, uh, hit, uh, that hit everybody uh, was uh, back in the, early, you know, the 19 teens. So uh, not, not a whole lot of experience uh, with specific uh, pandemics. That said, you know, I think people don't recognize how much of utility preparation 
uh, and continuity of operation planning is actually rooted in pandemic. Uh, and the reason for that is that it's a good thought exercise, right? If I don't have access to these people or these facilities or these supply chains, uh, what am I gonna do to remain operational? Uh, and so actually uh, the foundation of continuity planning is rooted in pandemic, uh, at least uh, among uh, EEI's member companies here in North America. Um, maybe I should talk about that really quickly. So EEI, many of you know, represents uh, the investor owned electric companies in the United States, but uh, we also partner very closely with municipal systems, cooperative systems, independent power generators, our Canadian partners, because it is an interconnected North American grid. Uh, and so that relationship takes the form of the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council, which is a representative body of CEOs from all of those segments of the sector here in North America that work under blue skies to prepare for uh, all manner of threats to utility operations. Uh, when an incident happens, uh, whether it's a cyber threat, a physical threat, the storms, uh, hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires uh, that we see, uh, the ESCC stands up in a battle rhythm, in an incident response cadence. Uh, and we've been in that incident response cadence uh, with CEOs and senior government officials from all across uh, the utility sector in North America uh, since uh, late February, early March. So we're on about week six now. One of the very first things that the CEOs uh, of that organization said to folks like me uh, is we need to stand up at what we've called tiger teams. Uh, just a good name to put on things, these kind of tactical focused teams looking at potential problems, potential complications uh, to utility operations given the pandemic. That the output of those teams is that resource guide that has been uh, referred to. Uh, what I like to tell people is we are literally writing the book on the COVID-19 response as we live it. Again, that is not because of some deficiency in planning. That is because those foundational continuity of operation plans that were rooted in things like SARS and MERS and avian flu and swine flu, all from the early 2000s, as I said before, never actually materialized, at least not here in North America. And so what we've had to do is take that foundational work and then apply uh, the unique attributes of this particular virus and these particular circumstances so that we can be prepared uh, for all manner of contingencies in this extraordinary time. Um, the, the, uh, the way that we have done that work is to take people from all across the sector. So experts uh, from companies all across uh, North America have given their time voluntarily to stand up these tiger teams and to identify those challenges that we might face should this uh, situation last uh, two weeks, two months, six months, longer. Again, all of these uh, different uh, 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 challenges become exacerbated uh, the longer that this situation uh, goes on. And we don't want to be figuring things out when the proverbial wolf is at our doorstep. We would rather use the time today to be prepared. I've told people this repeatedly. I would much rather six weeks from now people look at the utility sector and say, boy, you overreacted or you overprepared or none of those things that you thought might happen ever did happen. That is a much better set of circumstances than a month or six weeks from now, all of us looking at each other and saying, wow, we really wasted that time that we could have used to prepare for all of these contingencies. I referred to um, the unique attributes of COVID-19. So let's talk about that for just a, a quick second. Uh, again, SARS, MERS, avian flu, swine flu, all of those were uh, foundational, they, they were, but they were written in the abstract and they didn't have, uh, uh, at least here in North America, specific impact. So the impact that we're seeing from COVID, you have uh, people who are highly contagious while asymptomatic for up to 10 days to two weeks. That really creates a challenge for operations, keeping your employees healthy. How do you continue operations given those unique attributes? 
the phrase that's come up a lot is we need to decentralize operations in order to minimize the inevitable impact of a positive case. That idea that we can operate safely uh, with personal protective equipment, PPE. We can operate safely if we decentralize those operations. We can operate safely if we uh, identify those highest priority, hard to replace workers uh, that we need to keep healthy and in the fight at all costs. So what, what, the way that the ESCC uh, asked us to sort of form these tiger teams is to look at potential impact. So here are the, now it was five for a while. We are now at six tiger teams. I'm gonna run through each of those quickly and, and then talk about each of their challenges discreetly. Uh, and then I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Dave Botts, to talk a little bit about uh, his perspective on operations from a cyber threat perspective. So uh, the tiger teams that we have formed, I'm gonna go through each of them quickly and then I'm gonna talk in a little bit more detail. Control center continuity, generation facility continuity, supply chain challenges, access to and operations in quarantined or contaminated environments, mutual assistance, that's where we go and help each other after a storm, just had a chance to practice that, I'll talk about that. Uh, and then the last is return to work. What does a responsible return to work look like? And again, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. So let me take those first two, control center continuity and generation facility continuity. Uh, those are very similar, but all of you in the electricity sector all across uh, the globe understand that transmission and distribution don't necessarily speak generation. So the T and the D don't always talk to the G. So we took them separately. But a lot of shared challenges. These are highly skilled, hard to replace employees. Uh, these are nerve centers of our operations. These are places that have to remain operational. Uh, and have some unique challenges, whether it's close quarters, uh, whether it is a lack of redundancy. Uh, most of these have a, a primary and a secondary, but, but some, in some cases you have a high priority uh, facility. So our companies uh, here in North America have wanted to decentralize operations. So one way you decentralize operations with generation and control center facilities is you go to those primaries and those secondaries, you go to backups, you use that redundancy that is inherent to the system but that's not always an option. If that's not an option, the other way that we've kept these systems operational is to go to what I consider, and many of our companies consider, an extraordinary measure. That is sequestering or quarantining healthy employees at the facility or in uh, vehicles, uh, uh, sleeper uh, vehicles out front or in local hotels. Uh, and so what are the protocols for keeping those people healthy? How do we test them before we put a healthy person in with a potentially sick person and contaminate an entire shift. So those processes and protocols have been written literally as we live the COVID-19 pandemic. Generate uh, so, uh, supply chain challenges. So I mentioned two weeks, two months longer. Supply chain means a lot of things in this industry, right? It's the chemicals that we need to operate our facilities. It's the commodities that we need to generate electricity. Uh, it is those PPE uh, and other uh, equipment and material that we need to keep the system operational. The challenges that you see today would be very different six months from now. And so having a Tiger team that is looking at today's challenges, looking at today's demands, and looking over the horizon at what might come, should this last a lot longer, has allowed us to not be flat-footed, has allowed us to be responsive and reactive before bad situations, before there's a, a, a real uh, scarcity of those resources that we need. The biggest focus lately has been uh, fire-rated face coverings uh, and has been uh, testing uh, for those sequestration environments. But we're also looking at those chemicals that we need because the chemical sector uh, here in North America and globally is impacted. So again, looking at all those potential challenges, finding alternatives, finding creative solutions. My favorite creative solution so far has been uh, distilleries in North America are now making hand sanitizer. Uh, we've had uh, sewing circles who are making face coverings. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways uh, that uh, people are creatively uh, addressing the, the scarcity of some of these critical resources. Access to and operations in controlled or restricted environments um, or, or, or contaminated environments. Uh, 
this goes to the need for personal protective equipment. This goes to how do we um, move between and among areas that are locked down. So here in the United States, every one of our federal emergencies, anytime uh, the, federal energy, uh, the federal emergency management agency, uh, FEMA, stands up uh, to respond to an incident, it is federally supported, state managed, locally executed. That means our state and local governments here in North America, here in the United States, have a lot of authority. And so as different places lock their, uh, 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 their footprints down, lock their service territories down, how we move between and among uh, those places becomes a challenge for our critical employees, right? Well, there's plenty of people like me, as you can see, I, I get to work from home, but our frontline employees who are doing emergency work, who are doing gas leak or downed wire, who have to go to those control centers and generation facilities need to be able to move freely. How do we make sure that they are able to do that? So we've addressed some of those challenges. Um, if you have to go into a home, one of the things that we have learned early on from some of our medical professionals is just assume everyone you come in contact with, customers in the community, are contagious. So if that's what we need, if we're assuming that we are coming in contact with people who are contagious at all times, we need that personal protective equipment. We need those protocols for how we're going to enter homes. Uh, and we need uh, those, uh, that guidance from the Center for Disease Control, the, Federal, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, medical professionals who are helping us, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, again, all uh, U.S. Uh, agencies taking that guidance from uh, those federal sources and helping to apply it in critical infrastructure settings. Again, writing the book as we go. Uh, the ESCC, that sector coordinating council I referenced, has a motto. It's unity of effort and unity of message. How do we work together and communicate to the public, to our customers with a unified voice? We've added to that unity of effort, unity of message, unity of guidance, that resource guide taking the CDC uh, and, and other government agency guidance and helping it to be applied, uh, again, in critical infrastructure applications. Uh, so that's access to and operations in uh, restricted and quarantined and, and uh, contaminated environments. Mutual assistance. Uh, this is something I think that happens globally where uh, uh, there are only so many people on earth who know how to operate and restore an electric system uh, that has been impacted by a natural disaster. They're all in our sector. And so we have to help each other. Uh, and so we have been uh, helping each other through mutual assistance. We have hurricanes here uh, in North America. We've had a lot of experience with them in the last couple of years uh, where they've been pretty catastrophic uh, to uh, our utility operations. So a lot of experience in helping each other uh, restore power. How do you restore power in a pandemic environment? Who is responsible for bringing their personal protective equipment? Do we have enough of it if thousands of crews are going to descend on an affected area? Uh, how do we decentralize so we don't have staging areas with hundreds of people? How do we onboard people who are coming uh, to help in, in a, an emergency situation? Can we onboard them virtually? Uh, how do we limit the number of people in trucks and in buckets? What kinds of PPE do we need to allow those people to operate safely in this customer-facing, community-facing environment? Uh, fortunately, we developed some of those uh, uh, checklists several weeks ago because uh, over the last 96 hours, uh, we had had a lot of tornadoes uh, and uh, serious straight-line winds that impacted more than 1.5 million customers in the southeastern and, and uh, northeastern United States. Uh, that experience uh, because we were not flat-footed, because we did not wait for the challenge uh, to, to face us and, and then have to start figuring out what those protocols were going to be, we were better prepared. And we are already doing after action. What have we learned from the nine, last 96 hours of, of severe spring storms that we can apply to uh, the hurricanes that we're uh, likely to see or the wildfires that we're likely to see uh, later in the summer? Uh, finally, and this is one that's a little challenging, this idea of return to work. Uh, how do we uh, responsibly return uh, in a way that doesn't show that we're taking our foot off the gas, that we recognize how important uh, uh, the preparations for operations in pandemic environment are, but understand that we're going to go back to something that resembles normal. And again, there's gonna be challenges to this new normal. What can we do today so that we are not 
preparing for or responding to or reacting to those realities uh, uh, at, at, at when when the uh, when the the challenges are upon us. Let's think about it now. So with that, uh, I, I've talked to you a lot. I do want to turn it to my colleague Dave Botts, and I'm going to do it by explaining this. Anytime there is an incident, uh, the scams uh, and cyber threats uh, are uh, amplified. We, we see more of them. The good news is we're used to that, especially with all the storms that we've seen. Uh, we know what happens, uh, our, our adversaries and just uh, people who are looking to take advantage of the situation uh, will, uh, will, will come out of the woodwork. So uh, in addition to all those operational challenges we have, we've also got some cyber challenges uh, that Dave can talk about. And the only thing I'll say, uh, just because it's a pithy way to put it, hygiene in a pandemic environment matters. Wash your hands, don't touch your face, all of those uh, things, wear the face mask, uh, all of those things that we have uh, come to learn about this new reality. Well, cyber hygiene matters also. So be aware, be prepared, understand uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, adversaries take advantage of these situations. Uh, and just as with all those other operational challenges, let's think ahead of time uh, before uh, we are caught flat-footed uh, and, and not prepared for uh, the contingencies that this pandemic is throwing at us. Uh, and uh, we'll keep writing that book uh, on pandemic response. Uh, and it is a public document, so I appreciate Will and Steve referencing. Go to electricitysubsector.org. Uh, that is uh, our website uh, that houses that. By definition, pandemics are global. Uh, and so in addition to learning from what we're doing here in North America, I promise we have learned from what's been happening globally. And it's been an extraordinary opportunity uh, to be able to share globally these lessons. So I really appreciate this platform uh, that USEA and USAID have put together. And I really look forward to the opportunity to learn from all of you, just as I think you uh, can, can learn from, from our experience here in North America. So with that, Dave, can you talk to us a little bit uh, about uh, our perspective on, on cyber and physical security during this extraordinary time as well? Yeah. Thanks much, Scott, and thanks also to USAID and USEA for this opportunity to share. One of the things that Scott mentioned is that um, the cybersecurity risks have not gone down uh, while the world, the globe, is facing this pandemic. Uh, we have observed, and perhaps your cyber team is also aware, that the number of phishing attacks, email attacks, uh, have not gone down, rather they have gone up. Uh, phishing attacks that are uh, uh, coronavirus themed, uh, attacks that also uh, uh, share falsely about uh, testing or remedies have gone up. Um, and one of the things that is uh, rather discouraging is that uh, ransomware attacks have also increased and they have been targeted at healthcare providers, and so um, that is uh, particularly discouraging. We have observed uh, in the U.S. the need to uh, continue to uh, invest in virtual private networking technology to assist uh, utility workers where possible to be able to work uh, remotely. Um, although having said that, to also recognize the associated risk related to the use of VPNs in remote operations. Finally, just an encouragement to maintain uh, good and best practices regarding patching, especially things like patching Microsoft platforms. We observe that uh, yesterday was Patch Tuesday uh, for Microsoft, and already there are a number of attacks in the wild as it were, that are going after various Microsoft computing platforms. And so even though things are uh, very difficult and challenging right now, we strongly recommend that utilities um, not lose sight of the need to maintain uh, effective and appropriate patching uh, practices and disciplines even in these challenging times, because the adversaries uh, are, are certainly taking advantage of this situation and continuing to attack critical infrastructure, including electricity service providers. So, um, Will, I know we're, we're short on time, and so 
I'll hand it over uh, back to you uh, to introduce our next speakers. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you very much to you and Scott for a really uh, thorough and informative presentation. Um, it's clear uh, to those of us in the industry uh, how much planning and uh, preparation needs to be made. But having this high level uh, overview of the actual nuts and bolts of how it's being done and the considerations that are being made, very, very useful. Thank you so much. And I encourage all of the participants and those on the call to go to the uh, resource guide. Uh, Scott gave you a, a, an address. You also have a link that was provided in the uh, uh, email that Albert Dalb sent to invite you to this webinar. Go to the resource guide and see the specific best practices that are being developed and watch it evolve over time. Uh, and if you have suggestions that you'd like to contribute, please send them to us at USEA and we will be glad to forward them to EEI because as Scott and Dave both mentioned, uh, we can learn from each other, and that's the foundation and the hallmark of the Energy Technology and Governance Program as it's practiced by USAID, USEA, our partners at EEI, and the utility and regulatory uh, volunteers that, that, that participate in the program. Um, I think what we'll do is forego the Q&A at the moment. We have some questions, but um, I'm cataloging them, and we'll, we'll come back to them. But I would like to move to our, our next speaker, who is uh, Mr. Elir Shala from the Kosovo Transmission System Operator. Mr. Shala, if you would unmute your microphone and share your screen, uh, we'll look forward to seeing your presentation. Thank you. Okay, hello to everybody. Thank you, USID, Edison Electric Institute and the USEA for this uh, webinar, for this organization. It's my pleasure to attend in this webinar in order to explain some measures that cost uh, took in order to, pro to be protected by, uh, from this virus COVID-19. So before uh, showing the presentation, I would like to say that uh, me as a leader of this company together with my staff, we tried and we succeeded up to now to be calm and confident. Also, we wanted to make and we tried and we succeeded to communicate with all employees in order also they to be calm in this difficult situation with this COVID virus. And the collaboration as well, we succeeded to create or to establish the task forces or sub task forces in order uh, to manage this uh, situation. Uh, I think uh, that the compassion is uh, extremely important at this time because some of our staff or employees want to, to have some uh, time off if they want to work from home, if they need to have a little bit of space to look after their family members. So we consider this and we we manage this. So as you all of us, we are informed and we feeling this COVID-19 pandemic. Also in Kosovo, Kosovo is also affected from this pandemic. Even the number of infected and died infected people is actually under control. Electricity, electricity sector has been challenged due to efforts of pandemic and uh, Uh, do you see the presentation or? We just see the first slide. Yes, you need to, can you, can you advance your slide? Yes, thank you. Okay, sorry for that. In the current global health crisis, costs like all, all other TSOs is aware for their specific responsibility for the security of fossil electricity supply, which is a matter of uh, 
preserving social and economic life. In this uh, so taking consideration all this uh, situation with COVID-19, with this virus, first uh, immediately took all technical measures and financial analysis and uh, in order to be stable and uh, to, uh, to operate and as a transmission system operator and to have uh, the supply of electricity to all consumers in, in Kosovo. In the framework of the measures and the recommendations provided by Kosovo institutions, the management of cost has taken all measures and uh, that affect the prevention of the spread of the virus. And uh, on the other hand, maintaining the vit uh, vital function of transmission system. So based on this uh, situation on 13th of March, we launched to all staff, to all employees, the action plan for pandemia COVID with uh, two scenarios. And first scenario was with 12 topics. And second scenario was, is with 14 topics. Uh, meaning that uh, some of the scenario means, uh, first of all, to inform all employees uh, about the situation and uh, with disinfection of all uh, spaces or offices in uh, to all buildings and uh, machinery and uh, other measures that uh, I'm not going to mention all of them because these are in paper and uh, to mention 12 is uh, spending the time and also scenario two uh, we rearrange the, the staff and the works and some of them are working uh, uh, from home some of them uh, that are essential from the office and especially national dispersion uh, national dispersers and uh, operators in the substation uh, in these places when um, from national dispatch center we cannot monitor or control uh, such as substations. So on 15th of March 2020, we launched to all employees uh, the reorganization, reorganization plan and for work and staff. Uh, for example, for transmission operator maintenance planning, we decided they to work from home. Relay protection uh, employees as per the list of teams. Overhead line maintenance as per the list of teams. Substation as well. Substation operation. Uh, uh, we decided they operators in substation to work on a 24 hours shift and to reduce their movement. This is a reason that we shifted them to work on 24 hours and uh, other technical services as per the list of teams. System operator dispatchers, uh, the same, they are working on shift 24 hours and then other staff are arranged to work by ro rotation. Except uh, dispatchers, we established another three working teams experienced with system operation and uh, to work as dispatchers in case any dispatcher is infected with uh, this virus COVID-19. Also, the electricity market is functioning normally. We don't have any problem up to now. While scheduling and settlement are being performed from the house, from home by the relevant professional staff. Human resources, safety, health, and environment are engaged very engaged directly on disinfection of location and uh, distributing, distributing the masks and gloves for all our staff. And other staff from human resources are engaged by rotation, and some of them are working from home. We uh, issue to all employees, I mean the relevant staff of course, certificate or permission as per request of uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs in order to have rights to move through the entire ter Kosovo territory as requested, as I said, by Ministry of Internal Affairs to perform their duties as per the need. Also, we are uh, taking care uh, for ICT and SCADA EMS and uh, substation control in order, they are staff, professional staff, they are 
uh, fully aware for this situation and the very, uh, they are very engaged to make system operations secure and re reliable, taking into account any cyber, sec uh, cyber, cyber attack that may happen. Also, during this period, we uh, made several teleconferences or telcos with main actors in energy sector such as uh, ENSOE, because now, as you may know, we are in the process of the um, uh, final stage of the, the voting, all the voting process of the final voting process of the new connection agreement with ENSOE. And uh, we made also teleconferences with Energy Community Secretariat, government, our government, MCC program with uh, US and Energy Regulatory as well. So uh, this, all of them have been uh, technical measures that we took in order our system, first of all, our staff to be safe our system to uh, to operate in uh, security and uh, reliability and uh, all consumers to be uh, supplied with uh, quality electricity so uh, from the financial aspect we cost did the financial uh, risk financial assessment for uh, further four months from uh, march till june 2020 taking into account that CATS and CASCO will not pay obligation to cost because they are depending from the collection from end consumers. And we made some scenarios with 10% payment from CATS and CASCO to cost, 30%, 50%, and 70%. And based on this financial risk uh, assessment, uh, the, there are no financial risks identified for that period. Another uh, side, all cost employees receive the salaries on time because, uh, as you know, some maybe some public uh, or another TSOs they have problems with uh, salaries or private sector uh, in the world. But up to now, we don't have such a problem. Also, we are continuing with procurement activities, including uh, that for uh, reserve services secondary and tertiary regulation for function, functioning as a control area within control block with OST Albania, because this is very important for us. Uh, since, we are, as I said, we are in the final stage of voting process with uh, NSOE for new connection agreement. And after this uh, process of uh, voting, uh, another step is uh, signing of the new connection agreement. With uh, this new connection agreement with NSOE, will become independent control area that will operate together jointly within control block with Albania. So, from my side, no any issue to mention. So, I would like to thank you all attendees in this uh, webinar. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shala. Uh, if you appreciate your view from Kosovo. I wanted to uh, take, uh, uh, ask, uh, two, there were two questions that came in uh, while you were speaking. Uh, they were uh, uh, they were uh, intended for uh, Scott and Dave. One is a uh, question, are there medical staff on utilities in, in the United States and how uh, are they, what, what sort of authorities and guidance do they provide to the utilities on a day-to-day -day basis? So the answer to that is it depends. Uh, there are some companies that have uh, chief medical officers or medical teams. Uh, many companies have um, at least some sort of medical uh, uh, practice uh, where, where they're uh, supporting occupational safety uh, and health issues. Um, increasingly, in the last several weeks, you might imagine, uh, companies are also partnering with local uh, hospitals and, and uh, medical providers, uh, as well as with uh, epidemiologists, uh, sort of similar to how we work with meteorologists, understanding um, risk, understanding what might happen next, understanding where the hotspots are going to be, understanding best practices uh, and guidance for, uh, for, for medical response. So uh, it's a blend, and I would also expect that uh, after this, uh, there's going to be uh, a lot more 
recommended practices around um, uh, employing medical professionals for uh, preparation for pandemics. Great, thank you. Um, one, uh, one quick question for Dave Botts uh, from a colleague uh, in Ukraine. It appears that in Ukraine, there's been a three to four fold increase in attacks on VPN networks. Are we seeing a similar increase in North America? So thank you for the question. Um, we have seen an increase in attacks. I don't know that it is at the same level as is being experienced in Ukraine. In addition, one of the challenges is that um, there have been capacity challenges with VPN uh, uh, appliances in that uh, more staff are using more capacity of the VPN than it was initially uh, provisioned for. And so um, many companies are uh, working to increase their VPN uh, capacity to allow for additional staff to use the solution. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'm going to uh, move on. I'd like to move on now to our uh, our next speaker, Mr. Saltarovsky from EVM Macedonia, that will give us the uh, who will give us uh, a perspective from uh, the DSO, the distribution system operator perspective. Thank you, Sasha, for joining us. Greatly appreciated. Sasha, you'll have. To, oh, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, just a, just a moment. I guess you're seeing the share screen. Yes, we see it. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Thank to USA and USA to organizing this webinar. Thanks to all participants also, and this high level interest to discuss about the most actual global topic at the moment. I will shortly explain the situation in the North Macedonia. First, I will refer a bit to the last two years meetings that we had within our USA to USA group. Very often, often our main topic for discussion was the disaster response. But honestly, we have to confess, we always thought about, I don't know, earthquakes, some weather issues, and all actions that we discussed were how to sit as fast as possible together, how to organize the crisis management, how to organize the crews, but everything was discussed more how the people to be together and to work together in order to, to solve the issues. We never ever thought up to now for the pandemic or the actual issue, neither in the company, neither on our meetings. So, this is quite opposite for whatever we discuss because now everything that we organize, we should organize from the distance and not sitting together. So this really surprised us a bit and there is a lot that we can learn from the, from the situation. North Macedonia is one of the country that I think it, implemented one of the most radical measures, not that each country followed, but everything started on the 10th of March, recently after the discovering of the first corona case in Macedonia. So the whole kindergarten schools and university was closed. Very soon afterwards was also closed all shopping malls, restaurants, cafe bars, and one week later even was uh, announced the emergency state in the country and shortly afterwards the curfew started first it first in first couple of days they started from nine o'clock until five o'clock in the morning but soon later on or let's say from 8th of april the curfew was starting from the afternoon, 4 p.m. until 5 p.m. and the whole weekend. So this was quite big challenge, not only for the citizens, but for also for the companies like us 
to organize our work, which has to be 24.7. A lot of administration, a lot of documentation, a lot of permissions necessary in order to be able to, to organize the shifts and that people can work normally on their activities, especially to secure the electricity supply. What were the measures that we mainly implemented? I think they're more or less similar in each country and in each company. First, we try to minimize the face-to-face -face contact and to make the backup whenever this is necessary, especially for the critical staff and the critical departments in the company. Face-to-face -face meetings we digitalize as much as possible. So we try to avoid the personal contacts within the company. We try to decentralize the functions as much as possible. Many contact points. We have the front offices decentralized in each city which is the contact center to the customer. We closed them. We started with a limited capacity, but soon later on we closed fully. So all the contacts we digitalized via the call center or uh, email communication. Very soon we discussed the meter reading issue because there is the personal contact more or less to object of each citizens. The most of the meters in our country are also inside of the objects. So it means there is the risk for the staff, but also for the citizens. Therefore, we stopped the meter reading and we started with the estimation of the bills based on the historical data. And of course, as everybody, we also started to organize the people in the shift or some of them were working one day, the another, ones, another group was working another day with the purpose to not have the critical staff in the same time in the same place. It means if somebody is affected, that we always have the backup that can continue to work. It's worth to mention, especially the dispatching center and IT as a core bone in such a situation that it has to be uh, available. So in dispatching center, we also the organize the shift work that people are not mixed, but also we build up some backup as a room space, but also as a, as a staff that is always available in case if somebody is infected. As well as for the IT staff. Despite the organizational issues, of course, some uh, hygiene protection we started. So this was some action plan and the big com campaign, communication campaign with all our employees and guideline how they should use and when they should use. So we shared with them many liquid uh, uh, disinfectants. Uh, so some guideline about the car usage, how to disinfect the car, that car cannot be mixed with the, with the teams. If one team is working together, they should not be mixed with another team. Each employee was equipped with the masks, gloves, other protective equipment that was necessary and many other guidelines about the usage and instructions, manuals for all of this. So all canteens, coffee machines and meetings within the company were canceled or they started or they stopped to work. Regarding the operational stability. So we don't know until when this will take place. So therefore, at least we decrease the realization of the projects in the Q2, so in the second quarter. Estimating that if this crisis finish soon, that we can continue with our project and that there will not be the big investment disturbance until the end of the year. Material management. So the most critical equipment there is available in the stock, although we started to work only those activities that are really necessary to be done in this moment in order to save the stock as much as possible. In the first moment after the crisis, there were some issues with the transportations and delivery of materials, so supply chain was quite affected but in the meantime is recovering. So we are trying at least for the normal maintenance issues and some 
investment activities to continue in these circumstances as much as possible. New customer connection, so we are working on the new connection, but trying to avoid the contact with the customers as much as possible, so everything is digitalized, except some signatures that are necessary, but we are trying to organize them via post. Supply shortages, as I mentioned, there were some issues, but in the meantime, this process is becoming better and better, so it's improving. So at the moment, I would say from the operational stability, they are not so big issues. One of the most critical issue, I guess, especially in the East Europe, which might not be the case, for example, in US, it's about the collection. So there are still many persons in our countries, not only in the North Macedonia, I guess in the whole region, there are many citizens still paying by cash paying by cash in the banks, paying by the cash in the posts, or any other payment possibilities, which is with the cash. So there is a huge percentage, especially the older persons, they're still practicing this way of the payment. Having in mind the curfew, having in mind that the personal contact should be avoided, many people are scared to go physically in such a banks or posts in order to pay their bills. Additionally, some measures that were implemented by the authorities, like regulators, ministries, that in this period, the customer should not be disconnected. That this is the universal right of electricity and so on. So this also saved them in order that they do not go physically in some places and that they do not pay the bills. All this situation affected the working capital or the liquidity of the company quite a lot. So there are some figures in these slides that you can see, for example, that percentage of the open invoices before the crisis and at the moment are quite high. You can see that cash flow or cash income on the daily level is, for example, between 30 and 40 percentage lower than expected. Of course, you also can see that number of the payments in this last couple of weeks is have the downstream trend. This is quite critical. If the whole situation takes one or two months, okay, there is always the, the possibility to provide the liquidity, short-term liquidity from many other sources. But if this takes a little bit longer period, this is maybe one of the highest risks that we are facing at the moment, starting from the suppliers who, if they lack the liquidity, if they cannot provide enough working capital, they will start to delay it with the payment to the DSO, to the TSO, to the production companies or trading companies. And this might endanger the normal work of the companies quite a lot. So, uh, I would say probably a little bit different issue than in the United States, but I would put this even on the number one at the moment. Of course, the health is the most important and all of us is working hardly on it to protect our staff, to protect the citizens, but we also have to think how to provide enough funding for the business that afterwards security of supply can be provided to everyone. I would say this is still not linked with the economical crisis that might come later on because at the moment pensioners are getting their uh, pensions regularly, administration take their salaries immediately, companies still pay their uh, salaries regularly. So it's this decrease of payment is not linked with a uh, less salary or uh, dismiss of the employees, but it's more because of the lack of physical contact and high level of the cash payment to the bank. How this situation will look even afterwards, where probably some economical crisis will start as everybody speak, let's see. But I would put this, this topic as one of, of the priority topics, despite the other protection tools and organizational issues that we are doing. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Sasha. I think your presentation has uh, opened an interesting uh, vector of discussion, uh, particularly as we all know in, uh, in Eastern Europe, 
uh, as well as everywhere. The, the distribution functions are sort of the cash register of the utility, but they're a cash register and the, uh, it's where all of the cash flow begins for the rest of the sector. And uh, I think you're um, pointing the, uh, the issues out of collections in, in the, the problems that COVID-19 uh, and gender for collections, especially in Eastern Europe, where many of the older population still relies on physical payment centers, is, is an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, if Dave and Scott are still with us, are we seeing any pressure on utilities as uh, the economic crisis here deepens on their cash flow? And is this an issue that is being dealt with uh, by the, count, the coordinating council? Um, thanks very much for the question. Uh, there are there are becoming more and more liquidity challenges uh, that are being experienced by the utilities in the United States. One of the issues is that um, because the situation is really negatively impacting customers and and our unemployment rate in the United States is going up uh, very significantly. Um, a decision was made on the part of EEI members to suspend disconnect activity due to non-payment while this pandemic is underway. Uh, as you might expect, this has uh, significant implications on revenue collections. Um, there are uh, there are discussions underway with the government on access to liquidity and financing uh, during this time. So it's it's a problem for us. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, we have some other questions. I'm going to ask uh, now uh, if Mr. Zibzabadze would, uh, would share his screen and give us his presentation. Thank you, Sasha, for an excellent uh, presentation. I think we'll have a lot to say about this in our distribution system operator working group uh, when we are next able to see each other in person and convene and talk about all of these issues together. And I'll have some remarks about that at the end of, the, uh, at the end of this meeting. So, uh, Mr. Zibzabadze, thank you for being with us, and thank you for willingness, your willingness to share GSE's experience. Is it up, the presentation? Yes, we hear you and see your presentation. Thank you. So, dear colleagues, uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and honor to have this opportunity to share some thoughts on anti-COVID-19 measures that we implemented at the Georgian State Electro System. Uh, my first slide is about the corporate profile, which I'm going to skip. For those of you who don't know who we are, uh, GSE is a transmission system operator in the country of Georgia. We are in the middle of the value chain. We transmit electricity from power stations to distribution companies through high voltage transmission lines and substations. Uh, I would like to mention a couple of words about our pre-COVID-19 uh, readiness. Uh, two or three years ago, we have developed our business continuity plan. Uh, and by then, we knew that uh, low probability and high impact events would happen uh, sooner or later. So we were contemplating about different scenarios. We thought about earthquakes because the earthquakes happen from time to time in our country. Um, floods as well. We, we, we even thought about military activities because we have seen the full scale military activities in our country. Uh, 12 years ago, but we never thought about a, a virus. Uh, but I still think that uh, that type of mindset, that anticipation helped us a lot. And we as a company reacted very quickly. And if there is one word that can characterize uh, our response, it's the promptness, the, the quickness. 
So we were ahead of the curve from the very beginning. Uh, we had some doubts. Uh, we thought that it was overkill, uh, but it turned out that uh, what we did was the most prudent and uh, reasonable thing to do. Uh, we've, we, we also, we're also developing the information security uh, management system right now, and it helps a lot as well, uh, because this time, uh, it was mentioned a couple of times, that uh, every company is supposed to keep its IT and OD infrastructure safe, and the procedures that we have developed uh, under this ISMS system helps us a lot. Uh, our first move very, very early was the stay at home policy or the stay home policy. You know, lots of employees travel from GSE for business, for leisure. And from, from the very beginning, we asked all employees arriving from abroad to stay home and work remotely. A uh, couple of days later, the same recommendation was given to other employees with retirement age and some medical conditions, such as pregnancy, diabetes, hypertension, pulmonary issues. And later, and here I'm talking in terms of days, not in terms of weeks, all office workers started working from home. And since then, and of course today, only a very small number of employees, such as system dispatchers or substation personnel, come to the workplace. Even the repair crews, and we've got repair crews on uh, transmission lines, substations, they are summoned only in the critical situation. Uh, of course, we paid a special uh, attention to the National Dispatch Center or the National Control Center because uh, this is the unit where the brain of the system lies right now. And we have isolated our national dispatch center from the rest of the world. Uh, we split the dispatchers into three groups. Two groups work for the national dispatch center and one group works for the backup dispatch center at a different location. Uh, so the one group actually shows up at the National Dispatch Center and stays there for two weeks. Nobody is allowed in. So uh, these guys, our colleagues, they cook for themselves, they clean for themselves. And after two weeks, they leave and the second team uh, comes. Uh, so the members of the second team, while waiting for their shift, they stay at home, they do not go out to avoid all unnecessary social contacts. So as I mentioned, we also have a fully operational backup dispatch center. It's fully equipped and they can cover anytime the national dispatch center if it is required. Dispatchers transfer their shifts remotely so people don't meet each other. And when they need commute, uh, traveling, they use either their own private car or the company's car. So as I mentioned, only a very small fraction of employees actually show up at the workplace physically. For them, of course, we procured uh, personal protection equipment, such as masks, gloves, sanitizers, medications. They've been extensively trained by our health and safety department. And of course, we practice social distancing in our vehicles and on the working grounds. Uh, IT infrastructure is more important than ever. Um, all employees have uh, remote control, remote access to email and e-doc because uh, we have to work to do, we still procure things, we pay to our creditors, we pay salaries, so we work actually. That's why the availability of email and eDoc is very important. eDoc is a special platform that we use to share uh, memos and documents inside the company. So a small number of employees, they've been granted VPN access to the uh, company's ID network, because they, they, they need it, they have to fulfill job-related duties, but all connections, uh, they've been verified by authorized personnel. And this is the place where ISMS um, system and procedures 
uh, kick in and they help us a lot. We don't want the process to get out of control. But we know how risky it is uh, and how vulnerable we are at this point of time. IT support is available 24 seven via phone. I myself had a problem with access two weeks ago. I called my colleague and she solved the problem in three minutes. Um, so my last slide about communication. Communication is very important. We work very closely with the Ministry of Economy and uh, Sustainable Development, our 100% shareholder, but the internal communication is more important, even more important. So we, we use email as a primary source for communication because it's easier through email to broadcast all the recommendations developed by a World Health Organization or the national CDC. Also, all sorts of decisions we can very easily broadcast and we can very easily reach a large number of employees uh, about the decisions that the government of Georgia makes or the company management makes. So email is a primary source uh, uh, of communication with our employees. Uh, we prepared the posters. Also, they're available at different locations uh, with uh, uh, some sort of uh, preventative recommendations regarding hygiene and hand washing and social distancing, those kind of things. Uh, so I, I really do not want to sound uh, uh, overconfident because this virus can humble uh, any institution right away. But uh, so far, so far, uh, we have not had a case, a confirmed case of uh, COVID-19 among our employees. Uh, no blackouts, no brownouts so far, no disruptions in the supply of electricity. Uh, let's see how we will uh, continue handling this uh, uh, very, very, very tough situation. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I will be more than happy to, to respond, to answer. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zibzabadze. Um, we at USCA and our colleagues at USAID appreciate the partnership we have with GSE. We've been watching how you've been managing the situation and we're impressed by the measures you've taken. Thank you for sharing them with us. Um, thank you, Mr. I, I noticed that at the height of the uh, this webinar, we had as, as many as 105 participants join us. We have managed to hold on to 97 of them despite running overtime. I appreciate all of the speakers who have willingly um, contributed their time and have stayed on longer than we had expected. And I'd like to beg their indulgence to ask a couple of questions that have come through the, um, the chat line. One of them uh, relates to preventative maintenance. And here we're particularly interested in this because as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the programs that USEA and USAID are focused on relate to energy security. Uh, and we all recognize the importance of the sector to uh, social well being, and energy security obviously is paramount. Um, a question came in related to preventative maintenance. Um, how are the, uh, the TSOs and the DSOs managing preventative maintenance in this period of time? in Eastern Europe, and I'll, I'll also ask uh, perhaps if Dave would like to comment as well. Uh, is, is preventative maintenance being uh, delayed? And uh, if so, is it a function of uh, uh, just being protective of personnel? Is it a function of um, cost? And what are the long-term ramifications that we might expect to see six months from now if we're delaying preventive maintenance? So, Maybe um, uh, I can ask uh, Mr. Zibzabadze, since he was our last speaker, uh, to talk to that, uh, and then we'll, we'll go around the, the horn here and ask some of the other participants. Mm -hmm. uh, we do the preventative uh, maintenance if it is absolutely needed. For example, uh, cutting of the trees uh, it is vital because the, the branches can damage the overhead transmission lines and you have to do it especially now in spring, uh, otherwise uh, it will be a mess. So we do the, some, some, some portion of preventative maintenance, but again, um, by considering the, the, the risks uh, and uh, by carrying out all necessary preventive measures uh, 
uh, so social distancing, uh, personal uh, uh, protective equipment, they are all available for our employees, and we do the preventative maintenance okay, uh, from time to time. Yes, we do. Mr. Shala, would you like to comment? Uh, yes, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, as cost, uh, our maintenance teams, uh, we already we had one request for power outage of one interconnection line with Montenegro. And uh, this will be on uh, next week. So you use this opportunity to maintain our transmission line mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the feeder or bay 400 kV in the substation Kosovo D. Taking into account all measures that are uh, instructed by Ministry of Health, uh, social distancing and uh, other measures for the health. So we'll continue, uh, depends from the request or uh, the main goal is to be secured on interconnection lines with uh, Montenegro, as I said, with Albania, North Macedonia, with Serbia as well, and uh, our transmission system to operate uh, safely. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shala, very helpful. Dave, a quick question to you. Um, we have been, as you know, you've been a stalwart uh, charter member of our utility cybersecurity initiative working group, and we've tried to develop a, a risk-based approach to cybersecurity. I know this is a little bit outside of your, uh, of your area of uh, coverage at EEI, but are there tools like a, a risk-based approach to evaluate which preventive maintenance might be taken uh, and which may be able to be deferred uh, as utilities have to make these decisions, both from an, uh, perhaps from an economic perspective as well as from uh, a personnel protection perspective. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I, um, I am not aware of uh, particular tool sets that exist uh, sort of for today's age in terms of um, uh, to calculate sort of a risk reward and thinking about uh, things like the cost of capital, cost of uh, uh, return on equity as it pertains to um, deferral or not deferral of, of preventative maintenance. What I will tell you from the, US, the USA utilities is that for the most part, um, preventative maintenance activities are being done and being performed. And I appreciate the, the contributions from the other utility representatives on the call today is that um, these measures are being taken uh, with careful consideration for things like uh, distancing where possible, appropriate use of personal protective equipment, et cetera. But as a general matter, um, the U.S. utilities are, are doing maintenance activities because it, as, as the listeners today can appreciate and understand, uh, you, you have to do preventative maintenance, otherwise you'll, you'll end up with a very much larger problem. Uh, and Scott also mentioned that um, we've already uh, had mutual assistance events where we had a, a line of very catastrophic storms go across uh, multiple states in the United States. Um, as I understand, there were on the order of 19 fatalities, N not utility fatalities, but, but just general population fatalities in multiple states uh, over the weekend. And so um, the utilities are already wrestling with these issues, um, but attempting to, to perform restoration and maintenance activities using good practices and trying to protect themselves and protect their coworkers. Okay, thanks, Dave. I. Um... I suspect that uh, in Eastern Europe, this will be a question that we will 
uh, the, the ramifications of which we'll only know in the future as preventative maintenance may, standard preventative maintenance may be being delayed. It's something that I think we should consider in, in our working groups to, to discuss. I think we have time for one, uh, one more question, um, which uh, was asked for Mr. Shala. Mr. Shala, can you tell us um, what you see in terms of changes in your load uh, now that uh, the COVID-19, the effects of COVID-19, the work at home, uh, and only essential workers reporting to their jobs, the effect on the economy, what has been the effect on the load uh, curve in uh, Kosovo? Uh, comparing with uh, last year period, with the same period with now, uh, the consumption is, uh, doesn't have any difference. For example, uh, the peak now is around uh, 800 uh, megawatts. For example, last night was around 20 or 8 o'clock evening. So since uh, we as a Kosovo, you don't have such a high development of the industry, uh, I don't see any possibility to be increased uh, or to be decreased the consumption to be decreased the consumption in in our in our country okay thank you so, maybe uh, oh yes. i'm sorry please, please go ahead no, no it's okay okay thank you um maybe the same question to gse mr zibzabadze are you seeing a pronounced uh, change in the load profiles um as compared to pre-covid Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. In April, I'm just checking the numbers right now. Uh, we are 6.5% down in terms of kilowatt hours. Okay. In April. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, I want. I think that we've uh, run over the time that we had originally allocated here. I see that we still have 90 participants uh, on the line, so it means that we're uh, hitting the right targets in terms of the discussion. This is, has been quite an informative discussion, and I think it will inform the work of each of our ETAG working groups in the future. Um, I want to uh, say to our DSO working group in particular, those of you who are on the line, that I, um, I very much like the model that uh, EEI is pursuing with its partners in, in, in the United States in terms of this electricity subsector coordinating council, in particular how it's um, working on the COVID-19 and developing a set of best practices. And I would challenge you as members of the working group to think about how we might employ that model in our, in our region, in Eastern Europe and Eurasia, Southeast Europe in particular, and develop a, a, a capability that can um, work where we, where in which we can work together. And you may remember that that was the sort of uh, foundation of the, of the working group in the beginning. And let's think about how we can return to it because I think there's this, this business model that uh, we've seen and EEI has uh, demonstrated to us, I think could be very effectively used in Southeast Europe. With that, I wanna thank all of our panelists for a tremendously thoughtful and uh, instructive set of uh, presentations and discussion. I wish that we had more time, obviously. It's of great interest to those in the region. Uh, as I said, we'll take this up uh, in, at further when the next time we can see each other. I wanna thank all of the participants who've remained on the, on the line with us. And before we adjourn, I wish you the best of health and safety for you and your families. I look forward to the time when we'll meet again in Europe through our working group meetings. And until then, we'll use platforms like this to stay connected. Thank you so much. And, and God bless all of you. Stay healthy and safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye. Bye-bye.